decision making process. It says that the more diverse an organization's board, the better it will understand the needs of heterogeneous groups of stakeholders. Now, compared to um, both gender diversity and organizational financial performance, very few researches have been conducted on the relationship between both gender diversity and corporate social performance. And um, those researchers have to inconclusive findings, they had positive findings, they had negative findings, they had non-significant findings. So the positive findings say that uh, women have been characterized by their links with empathy, participation, cooperation and communication skills. Uh, literature has found that women are more involved in ethical judgments and they're more supportive of environmental disclosures. So where uh, these arguments were based on the resource dependency theory, which says that female members bring in two major strengths to the decision making of boards. Uh, one is enhanced sensitivity and the other is participative decision making style. So it says that their relational abilities enable organizations to interact with multiple stakeholders that result in improved communication and responses to alternative issues. Therefore, if we base our arguments on resource dependency theory, we can say that female presence on a board suggests a more socially oriented approach by the organizations. So where was the research gap? The research gap was because I've said that very few researches have been conducted on the relationship between both gender diversity and corporate social performance. But these researches, um, these studies used quantitative methods to find the relationship between gender diversity and corporate social performance. And there was this need of performing a qualitative study that will involve the actual participants who sit on the boards, who take these decisions on a daily basis. So I conducted interviews with Australian directors to find out what they have experienced, what they perceive about the benefits of gender diversity, what they have encountered. And another uh, gap in the uh, past literature was that uh, literature, uh, the existing literature on both gender diversity and corporate social performance, they tried to find a direct relationship between gender diversity and social performance, but it's not a direct relationship. There is process through which gender diversity can influence social performance, and that process is the decisions, decisions regarding CSR. So, and that has been overlooked by the existing literature. So in my research, I try to investigate whether and how does both gender diversity influence CSR performance through CSR decisions. And I have categorized CSR decisions into two types. One is CSR investment decisions and the other is CSR approach decisions. Um, CSR investment decisions, I have further categorized it based on the model provided by Lenson into three types. The first type is the philanthropic CSR, which is not a part of the core business strategy. It is more about charitable donations, philanthropic activities performed by the organizations. CSR integration is not yet a part of um, uh, can you see my slides? Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but um, yeah, um, I don't yeah. think they, they were flicking, but now they are, so thank you. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, what I was saying that uh, CSR integration is um, more about, uh, it's, it's still not a part of the core business strategy, but it's about improving the environmental and social performance of organizations. So maybe if um, I'm doing a business process that has a harmful effect on the environment, I try to mitigate it as much as possible. And CSR 
innovation is more about identifying an environmental or social problem and developing a product or a business process that will actually solve that problem. And about CSR approach, this is based on the model provided by Carol on social responsiveness. An organization can have four types of approaches towards CSR. It can have a reactive approach, which means that I don't want to do any CSR activity because it is not bringing any uh, benefit. Uh, and then it can, can you still, can you see my slides? Because I just got a message that she's on slides nine and 10. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, defensive CSR approach is more about doing just what I'm required to do. So I will do if I have an environmental regulation to follow, I will follow that regulation. Accommodative approach is being a little more progressive so if I have two environmental regulations to follow and I think that I can do two more to improve my environmental performance, I will take that action. And proactive CSR approach is very much related to um, CSR innovation decisions where the organization is actually leading the industry in terms of taking a CSR decision. So, and environmental uh, CSR performance uh, data I've collected from two perspectives. One is the environmental CSR performance data of the organizations and the social performance data of the organizations. And uh, CSR investment and CSR approach data I have further categorized into four groups, environment, employee, community, and sustainability. So I tried to see what kind of CSR investment decisions the organizations are taking for the environment, for their employees, and what kind of CSR approach they are taking towards the community or towards the sustainability of their organization. And the gender diversity on the boards, I have categorized it based on the proportion set by Kanta. These are the boards can either be homogeneous with very low level of female representation, skewed, tilted, or it can have a balanced or high level of gender representation. So this is my conceptual model where we assumed that board gender diversity is going to have an influence over the CSR investment and CSR approach decisions that both gender diversity will lead to uh, integrative and innovative CSR investment decisions and accommodative and proactive CSR approach that will ultimately lead to enhanced CSR performance, superior CSR performance by the organizations. And so I have interviewed 19 uh, directors from 14 Australian organizations listed on ASX. And what I have found is that both, uh, with regards to both gender diversity, we can see that for the 14 organizations from my study sample, None of the organizations are having a homogeneous board anymore, not even skewed. Most of the organizations are having a tilted gender diverse board and three organizations are having balanced gender representation on the boards. With regards to CSR investment and CSR approach decisions, what we have found is that no, none of the organizations are involved in only philanthropic activities. They are not only doing charitable donations under the umbrella of CSR, but they are being more uh, taking proactive approaches and making integrative and innovative CSR investments with regards to an environment, with regards to employee community and towards the sustainability of the organization. And with regards to CSR approach, we, we, we found that none of the organizations are having a reactive approach towards CSR anymore. They are primarily having a defensive approach because the first condition is to um, 
is to ensure the long term sustainability of the organization is to ensure that we have a good reputation, we can save the brand image. So yes, there is a primarily a defensive strategy. But other than that, along with the defensive strategy, these organizations are also taking an accommodative approach towards CSR. They are being progressive, they are taking various CSR initiatives and three of the organizations are also taking a proactive approach towards different dimensions of CSR. And this is the CSR performance data from the 14 organizations where we can see that the organizations are involved in various environmental and social CSR performance. Now, uh, while I asked the participants about their perception regarding the relationship of board gender diversity or women representation on the boards and its influence on CSR decisions and CSR performance. What they have indicated is that women directors are found to focus more on CSR. They address CSR more. So what they said is that they have found women directors to be more empathetic and compassionate, having a caring outlook, and they have a good networking ability with the various stakeholder groups. And about the leadership styles, the participants have mentioned that men and women do think differently because they are um, socialized differently, they grow up differently, and that is why if there is gender diversity on the board, it brings diverse perspectives and diverse thinking styles. And they have found that men think about formal power structure and um, regulations, whereas they have found women to be in a more mediating conflict resolving role. So when men are found to be more complacent, women were found to be more persistent. And if we can bring these two different styles of leadership together, um, a combination of controlling and consultative approaches together, there is more possibilities, there are better chances that there will be robust CSR decisions taken by the board and that will lead to superior CSR performance. And one more uh, important thing is that when boards take decisions about CSR strategies, they need to think about the broader stakeholder group, about the broader community. So if you don't have women on the board, if you don't have gender diversity, if you don't have women on the board, or if you don't have even men on the board, we are cutting off half of the community's outlook. So it is not normally possible to take a better decision. We don't have the proper representation from the community. So if you have a gender diverse board, they will bring in different perspectives, broader perspectives from the community, and that will lead to better CSR strategies and better CSR decisions, and ultimately better CSR performance. Um, so that's what I proposed that from the findings that both gender diversity influences CSR performance through CSR investment, and CSR approach decisions. But there are some other interesting facts coming up, up from the findings. One of the important factors was the number of women directors on the board. The participants mentioned that boards need to have a certain percentage of women members in order to experience the true benefits of gender diversity. Because what the participants mentioned that if there is just one woman member on the board, sometimes she might feel as the minority and she might feel that her voice will go unheard. And even if she's the minority in the room, she might feel intimidated and um, she might feel that there will be no one else in the room who will support her thoughts and opinions. So the participants mentioned that at least we need two to three women members on the board in order for the women members to feel comfortable um, around the people and the board and to put their thoughts forward. But this also depends on the 
um, organizational culture. If the culture is more open and embracing to gender diversity in those circumstances, even if there's one woman on the board, she might feel valued and she might not feel intimidated and she might feel that, yes, I can voice my opinion freely and that that will be an important decision that I'm making for the board. And another important factor was the unconscious bias. This is mainly based upon the selection bias assumption, which says that people are normally comfortable recruiting people like themselves. And because most of our leadership roles is still hold by men, so when a man is recruiting a candidate, if there's a man and a woman of equal expertise and knowledge and skills, and if there is no set regulation to achieve a gender diversity quota, it is sometimes expected based on this self-selection bias assumption that a man will recruit a man just to be comfortable working around him. So that is that is another factor that works in terms of both gender diversity. But then the participants mentioned some recommendations to reduce this um, bias and uh, increase the percentage of women members on the board. So one of the recommendations was to encourage homegrown diversity. So if we can address um, gender diversity at every level of the organization, and if we can encourage women employees to move up the ladder, if we can uh, give them the opportunity to uh, get the training and the skills that will make them board level materials, it will increase the supply of qualified women directors and if we can have a wide range of women uh, candidates to select from uh, we can solve the still tilted gender diversity on most of the boards that will help us to have a balanced gender representation in near future so thank you this is all about my presentations if you can if you have any suggestions that will be highly appreciated.